Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today we are going to paint this teacup in watercolor and then use some oil pastels for accents. I'm working on a different paper for, for today that I haven't worked on much. This is the Canson Heritage watercolor paper in the cold press finish. I was curious to try this paper because it's supposed to be very similar to Arches and right now Arches is sold out in the 9 by 12 pads pretty much everywhere so this would be a nice alternative and it runs about the same price. About $14 a pad at your major retailers online and you might even be able to find it at a big box craft store. That's where I got mine probably a year and a half, maybe two years ago, and I just hadn't gotten around to using it. I knew I was going to paint a square um, subject, so what I did was I tore off the excess paper and thought I would test my watercolors on the front and the back of the sheet to see if there was any difference since the texture was a bit different, and I decided to work on the front of this paper, but it does look like you can use both sides. I'd actually have to say that the sizing on this paper uh, might be a little bit harder or stronger than an arches because I do get a more distinct granulation on my watercolors when I'm using and I really like that effect with my watercolors having that extra kind of texture in the surface I think it'd be really useful for a lot of techniques it kind of reminds me of the really heavily surfaced Wattman paper um, that I've seen used from painters from a long time ago. Uh, that paper was discontinued, I don't know, back in the 70s, I think. So I was kind of excited to have a paper that would perform like that, hopefully. So I'll be playing with that paper a lot more and um, I'll let you know how I get on with it. But so far I've done a couple paintings on it and I really like it. So I'm sketching this with a mechanical pencil. I'm using a um, one with a 0.5 or 0.05 mill millimeter lead. It's a Mayped automatic um, mechanical pencil, but any mechanical pencil is fine. They generally all have HB lead, so they're fairly soft, which means you can draw with very little pressure and erase cleanly. And that's the same lead that's in your regular school pencils. So if you go get a pack of mechanical pencils at Target or Walmart, you're gonna have an HB lead, so you can use whatever. Whatever's comfortable for you to hold. And there are so many pencils available. This one's nice because it's a little bit bigger if you prefer a larger pencil. I also like the Pentel mechanical pencils a lot. And if you want something that's got a, like a squishy grip, there's the Bic Velocity pencil, which is really nice. Uh, Lead-wise, it's all they're all very similar, if not identical. Um, but it just depends on what you like the look and the feel of. And uh, sometimes it's nice to get a pencil that's kind of striking in appearance, so that way you don't lose it. Uh, and if you pay a little bit for a pencil, then you're less likely to misplace it too. And I'm um, just kind of sketching on the little sweet pea design on the front of this teacup. I thought it was kind of interesting and pretty. And I actually had come across the teacup when I was finding all my glass bottles and stuff when I was um, filming my glass class. So I set that aside because I knew I wanted to paint it at some point. I did spend quite a bit of time on the drawing portion of this project. So, you know, if you're looking at this in time lapse and you're thinking, oh my gosh, Lindsay drew that in like two minutes. No, Lindsay did not draw this in two minutes. This took oh quite a bit longer. Oh, and if you want a real-time version of this project, it is up in Critique Club. If you go to lindsaywyrick.teachable.com and click on Critique Club, you can learn more about it. If you remember, it's right there in your, um, right there in the classroom as soon as you log in. Uh, so check it out and... Yeah, you might like it. Critique Club is kind of neat. You pay five bucks a month and you can upload up to two paintings for a critique from me so you can get feedback on the stuff you're working on. There's also an archive of um, over three dozen real-time tutorials that tend to be a little bit more advanced. So if you're looking for a little bit more in-depth instruction, you're looking for a more challenging subject matter, it's a win-win. It's a you get access to all of those past tutorials as soon as you're a member and I upload two new ones every month. So hopefully, I f hopefully you feel like that's getting your money's worth. I think so. I try to uh, I try to do my best and, and put out a lot of value there. So what I've done here for the shadow is I mixed some um, this reddish brown. I think it's Caport Mortium brown, uh, some ultramarine, and also a little burnt sienna. Did that for the shadow, and you can see that gorgeous granulation I'm getting. And then for the uh, the teacup, I'm using some yellow ochre. Uh, I believe I had a little bit of. Uh, burnt sienna and uh, ultramarine in that as well. I had originally thought I was picking up the burnt sienna when I picked up the other brown, but I'm pretty sure it's like a port mortuum. I'm probably saying that wrong. Uh, basically, it means brown from dead people. That's not how they make it anymore, but it was like a, it, that's, that's what the original pigments came. It was from mummies. Uh, if you want a little creepy art history for you there. Um, but it definitely has this kind of bloody brown red color. It's quite transparent, but it also gives you an interesting granulation. It's kind of a neat little color there. Uh, this is the Magello Mission Gold Perfect Pan palette I'm using here. 
set of 24. I really like the colors. I like the size of the pans. They're, um, I would say they're, I think they're between the size of a half and a full pan. I think they're like seven and a half milliliters maybe. Uh, equivalent to a to a tube paint but the thing I don't like about this palette is that half the pans are on the top and half are on the bottom so when you close it half of your pans are upside down and in a humid environment like Maine in the summertime sometimes you get some pigment migration and that means you get oozy pigment that you need to scrape up and put back in their pans and it's kind of a drag so I don't recommend it if you I recommend the paints I don't recommend that palette if you live in a humid area um, I wish they had all the pans on one side and then the other side for mixing I do like the material of the palette it's made out of it's that bulletproof glass material which is actually a plastic but it doesn't stain and your paint actually spreads out on it like it does on a glass or a ceramic palette so it's a really cool um, material but they actually make a bulletproof glass palette that's much better laid out you just buy individually and you put your own paints in it um, but I just uh, I, I like the paints I like the material the palette's made out of I do not like pal I don't like palettes in general that have the wells on the lid uh, that's because I think I live in a fairly humid environment. Um, if you live in the desert, it's not going to be an issue, but definitely an issue here. Now, inside the teacup, there was actually some printing. It said July. This teacup with my, was my mother-in-law's, and uh, we share the same birth month, so um, I always like that teacup. And so I painted that in before I painted the tea and decided to give it some time to dry before I went over it. That would give me, hopefully, the impression that the words are under the tea, you know, so you're kind of like looking through the tea where the watercolor is transparent. That effect should work out pretty well. And the tea bag was really neat because it's kind of one of those, um, it's a, it was by Tea Fort is the brand and the tea was really good and it was my last tea bag like this and it's like a um like a pyramid shape kind of it was really neat and then the tea tag is a little leaf and i thought that was so cute so and i thought it also kind of brought out the leaf design with the sweet peas on the cup so i thought that worked together so i do actually have that teacup sitting in front of me on the table as i'm painting and um and I was able to paint it for a few days before it got moldy, because even tea will get moldy. Isn't that a fun fact? <laughs> it's gross, isn't it? But uh, but yeah, needless to say, I did not drink the tea. Um, and I just basically did some kind of flat colors. I mixed the colors I needed on my palette and then just kind of filled in the shapes. Uh, I could add a little detail later. This was kind of a puttery project. It took me about an hour and a half, all said and done. Um, I definitely wished I had gone with a more looser format as I was working through this. Um, sometimes, you know, you, you set, around, set out to paint a painting and you're thinking, I'm going to do this more realistically. But then you get a certain ways in and you're like, oh, you know, I think actually it would have looked better if I had done it with a more loose hand. So I might paint this cup again and do it like a little bit more loosey-goosey. Maybe I'll actually paint it and say, okay, Lindsay, you got 10 minutes and then you're going to drink your tea while it's still hot. And, uh, and that would work. I can't microwave that cup because it has gold edging on it, which, uh, which I will, uh, you know, create in a little bit. So now that this first layer is dry, I'm going over with some shading and I do my general mix of burnt sienna and ultramarine blue to get my nice darks. It's a really reliable mix and uh, the other thing I like about it is that it has some texture to it. I think it's a little more interesting than just using like a Payne's Gray or another neutral tint that might not have any granulation. Of course, because it has granulation, because it's made with two sedimentary colors, that color would lift. So in a situation where you might want neutral tint as an underpainting, that's going to work better than this mix because this mix would lift up, whereas neutral tint has more staining capabilities. Um, and uh, also I'm using this kind of like over everything as a shade. If you want to tone down a color, neutral tint might be better since it's designed to be able to adjust the saturation and darkness of a color without tampering with its hue. So it would still, like if you used it on something yellow, it should still look yellow in the shadow. I don't know if I really buy that. I tend to mix my own shadows with opposites and other colors that I've already been painting, but that's the, that's the premise behind neutral tint anyway, in case you were, in case you were curious. Now I'm putting in some of the details in the saucer for the little uh, the little sweet peas there. Um, I have to say, when I was painting this, I was getting frustrated with the saucer. I was feeling like it was just wonky and out of out of whack. The thing that's funny about a teacup and saucer is that you it's the edges of the saucer are lifted up. It's not as much like a plate where it's a little bit more flat and you just have a little bit of raised edge. You only have a small foot of a saucer touching and the rest of it's going upwards. So it's almost like kind of like a bowl. So when you're painting it, it can look very awkward and very wonky. And then your shadow can look weird. Um, 
So I did kind of struggle with the shape of that. And you can see turning it around, that helps me with keeping things symmetrical. It also helps me that I can reach in um, to a certain area and paint it a little bit better. Now I did go in with some of the white uh, watercolor in this set. It's not a really opaque white watercolor, but I thought it could do a good job at giving me those reflected um, highlights. So not the really bright ones, but like, you know how like you just get some ambient light bounced onto an object. That's what I'm trying to get here with the white watercolor. That does get more transparent as it dries. And then I grabbed my Posca pen and I thought, you know, I'm going to do some of the shiny highlights on the gold trim or the gold edging of the um, of the cup and saucer. And I thought that might do good. My Posca pen was not cooperating, so I grabbed a gel pen and carried on. Um, and that did help a bit, but I was really feeling like uh, I couldn't get the contrast that I wanted in this picture, I was feeling like it just seemed kind of flat. And I was also thinking that my colors didn't seem as vibrant as they ought to be. I felt like I had a really big shift between wet and dry. And I generally, I don't remember, I haven't painted with these Magello Mission Gold paints in a long time, but I don't remember having a lot of shift between wet and dry with these colors. I thought they stayed pretty intense throughout. So I was wondering if that might be an effect of the paper which is unusual if you have a paper that's really heavily sized. You usually have a very vibrant color to your paint and you usually have less of a shift. So I was kind of, um, you know, working with a paper I've never used before and a paint that I haven't used in a long time. So I was, I was getting a little bit of struggling there. And I was also fighting with the idea that I wished I had painted it looser. So I decided to splash, uh, splash on some colors. I splashed some water on first. And then I splashed the, uh, some of the paints that I've been using over it. And I was just kind of feeling like there was something wrong with the shadow. I don't know. I just, it was bothering me. I wanted it to break up a little bit and maybe go into, fade out into some loose splashes and splots. So that's what I did here. Um, and I do like it. I was kind of like, as I was watching back the video, because you kind of forget the different stages of your painting once you're done, I was kind of thinking, oh, now I, I kind of was like, wished I didn't do the splashes. But now, looking at the splashes, I'm glad I did the splashes. I'm, I like to do the splashes. You don't have to do the splashes on your painting, though. I get that all the time. People would be like, well, I wouldn't do that to my painting. I wouldn't put splashes on my painting. Well, you don't have to. There's no law saying you follow my tutorial. You must do it my way. No, no, silly. You don't do it however you want to do it. You do it in the way that speaks to you. We're different people. We're different artists. We're going to be interested in different things. We're going to like different techniques. We're going to like different colors and different mediums. And that is wonderful. We have to celebrate these differences and not try to make cookie cutter copies of one another's work. There's, there's, um, that's fine for learning. That's fine if you want to. That's fine if you like the way mine came out. But if you want to do something different, maybe you prefer coffee and you want to do a chunky coffee mug. Do the chunky coffee mug. It's up to you. It's your artwork. So, um, um, I decided to use some oil pastels, which you may not like, but I, I thought this would add some richness and I really like the richness it added to the tea itself. I'm using some silicone blending tools to blend out this, the, um, the, uh, oil pastel. These can be found very inexpensively on Amazon where uh, oftentimes they're sold for clay sculpting or for fingernail artists and they're cheaper than buying the color shapers that are meant for art supplies or for artists. I think it's just because they have a bigger market so they can sell them cheaper. But anyway, don't don't spend, you know, triple the price to get the color shaper brand. I don't think. I have some color shapers and they're fine, but you know, these work just as well. And they actually have cute little sparkles in them because they're meant for nail artists. Uh, and they work really well and you, you know, they're, they're perfect for this. And I'm just kind of um, adjusting a little bit and popping color where I need it to pop. Mostly mostly with this, I'm doing shadows, highlights, and tea because the tea just looked too dull and the tea really should have that rich, transparent look. And honestly, the oil pastels did a great job at that, which you wouldn't think that that would be the best um, the best use for oil pastels since they tend to be opaque. But when you kind of like rub them out so they're um, thin, you can get a really nice, lustrous, transparent look. So, um, you know, try it. Use whatever oil pastels you have. You don't have to have these expensive, bougie, Sennelier oil pastels, although they are lovely. You do not need to have them. Um, and I did use a little bit of Gamzol solvent to blend the shadow out under the teacup because it was a little too, uh, too solid. And that was pretty much it. I hope you enjoyed this time-lapse demo. And if you want to see the real-time version, go check out Critique Club. I'll put a link in the video description so you can find it easily. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, happy crafting.